place to put the results. I'm going to describe how I want to read this and where to put the results.
sack up. Let's parse this and let's find out where my confusion came in. My confusion came in is my example here is written in VB and in VB the manner that you refer to things in other namespaces is differently. Different things are available to you. Pardon me? I've noticed that. Yeah. So therefore some of these class names like iDataReader you have to fully qualify with the <coughs> namespace in front of it. So my notes have for example here data.iReader because system was automatically imported in VB whereas system is not imported here so what do I do I could go up and import it or I can use the full qualifier of that of that object and so that's what I did so that's why I was confused with that why I didn't see it all right now this we should be back on track so what does this do all right now that we know why I'm confused let me rephrase that. Now, why I'm confused this time. All right. What does the statement do? This statement, remember, here we specify how we're going to read the data. And we're just going to loop through the data. We're just going to read through the data. We're not doing anything fancy like going back and forth or updating or anything like this. We just need to read through it. So, my reader is where we're going to put the results to this query. All right. So I'm creating an object of type system data I reader that's going to contain my data reader, which is a structure that are going to, it's going to allow us to loop through the data. All right. Um, how are we going to fill that by doing the select? All right. By doing the select in this parameter, I believe empties out those arguments after the select is done, the arguments that we set up here. So, in effect, what we're doing is we are doing the select and we're stuffing the results in this object, which is of this type. Now, what we're doing here, the bit in parentheses, is what's known as casting. That effectively is converting the results that we get to an iData reader object, which is necessary to do because we set the, the, the read mode for this to iData reader. If we did the data set, then we'd cast it a different way, I would imagine. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read that data reader. And I'm going to say,
Let's create an int of, let's say, max position. I'm going to say my reader that read. Now again, because we've rigged the deck, we know that it's always going to return one row. So I'm going to cheat a little bit here, and I'm not going to test to see if this read worked or not, because I know it's going to work. All right. The only way that it wouldn't work is if there were structural changes in the database or if the database was locked or something really, really big, in which case it's going to blow up. All right. If we had a bit more time, we would talk about try catches, all right, and how try catches allow us to process the error code. Uh, but again, um, this would be the place for the try catches. We would, we would wrap all of this database access in a big try catch block. So if there was an error occurred, it would go and it would process it. So now what we want to do is we want to grab the variable. We want to grab from the reader the zeroth column. Well, what's the zeroth column? Well, we're only retrieving one column. So that's column number zero. So therefore, the count is going to be in the first rows, position zero. All right. Oops. Now, I'm doing this little cheat because I know it's only going to return one row. If it was returning multiple rows, I'd have to write a little loop to read it and do something with the values. Read the next one, do something with the values. But here, because I know that this is only going to return one row, all I have to do is do a uh, uh, one read to grab the first row, first and only row, and then grab the zeroth element and store it in the variable. Yes? So does read... Um... <clears throat> The first time you call it always gets the zeroth row. And yes. If you call it again. It would get the row one. The next row. So it's yeah. always getting the next. It's, it's a sequential read. Because that's all we said we need to do with this. All we said we need to do with this is to do a reader, to do a sequential read. So we're not doing anything fancy. We're just reading one, one two, three, four, the old kind of sequential read through, through a file. So now we have max position. All right. And we can say max position equals max position plus one. And then we can do our insert and we can now actually fill in the value of that position with the parameter.
those and I can tell. So we got a The reason I had to do this is you have to look, this function expects all of the values that you give it to be strings, and you specify the type with this variable, and therefore it does its, its conversions and all that. All right, let's run this and pray that it works. Don't you say guarantees? I was mistaken if I said that. All right, so we'll go in here into our default page.
if I were interested, I'd go back to see what's different between this and what I did a minute ago. All right. And I thought it was the same, but all right. All right. So let's go. I probably should have it returned to the, and I'll put that in after it adds. table, we'll see that the one I just added is in position two. All right, so let's go in and try this again. Let's go pick this movie. We'll click to add it to queue. Now let's go and look at the database, and that should be in position three in the queue, which it is. All right. This is again; it's being displayed in primary key order. That's why you see it on top of the one that we just added. All right. So I know this is hard. Uh, th this might be hard to to get your head around. The good thing is, is this code. going to be pretty consistent. You know, this is consistent with what you did with the insert. The select is a little different because again, you're returning a, a, a row set. And if all you want to do is read and grab some values from it, like all I want to do here, if you use a data reader and you have these few instructions, you can go and you can access that and you can loop it uh, over and over again. That read function, by the way, returns a Boolean. Uh, the Boolean indicates if it's at the end of the line or not. If it, if it returns a true, it means, hey, it succeeded. If it returns a false, it means it's at the end of the line. So if you would ever need to loop through the code to do that. All right. Session variables. Session variables are a way to remember things from page to page to page. All right. If you think about Angel, when you log into Angel, all right, you don't have to log on to every single page. That would be a drag if you did. All right? Instead, it remembers your credentials when you logged on. You can use a session variable. You can create a session variable, rather, like this. Simply by saying session, and then in parentheses, not parentheses, square brackets, You specify what name you want to give the session variable. Effectively, the session collection is like a giant array. The difference is instead of referring to the, that array element by subscript, you refer to it by the name of the field. So here we've created a field named user ID in our session collection, and we've given it a value of 1. All right. Probably could get rid of this now. Right, the, the quotes. How do you retrieve a session variable? Well, again, same way. You can re oh, no, shoot. you can retrieve it by simply saying session and then the square brackets. Now, the one thing that you have to remember, though is that you can put any object in a session variable. Therefore, you are going to have to do some sort of data conversion when you pull that out. In this case, this function needed a string, so the toString would do. 
In other cases, if I was doing math, for example, on this, I might have to cast it to an integer. All right. Data conversion is something like for your project or for your assignments that we can work on next week in lab if you have issues with that, because I could understand where that might be a little confusing. How long does a session variable retain its value? More or less. The, the more precise answer is it retains its value until the session times out. One thing that you have to remember is that the web server only knows you through requests. So let's say I go into Angel and I log on. All right? And I take a phone call and I go get a cup of coffee and I come back. I'm still logged on, right? And I do some stuff and so on and so forth. Then I close my browser. The web server doesn't get a signal saying that I've closed the browser, right? You don't make a request to a web server when you close your browser. You just close your browser. The only way the web server knows that you're no longer active is if a certain period of time goes by and you haven't made any requests. Now, you may not have made requests because you're in the middle of thinking something through. Student asked me a tough question, you know, and I'm sitting there scratching my head thinking of the answer to it. So I might be inactive because of that. I might be inactive because I've gotten bored with grading my stuff and I head over to CNN to see what's going on in the news. My com I might be inactive because my computer crashed and powered off, power failure. I might be inactive because I've closed the browser window. The point is, is that the web server doesn't know when you're inactive or not, inactive for a reason or not. Therefore, what is done is there's a session timeout field that, you, that, that is set on the server. You can set a default for a session timeout and you can extend that uh, for individual sessions. Now, the way that it works is, is that your session data stays active until one of two things happens. Until the session times out, or until you explicitly log off and the code expires the session. You'll notice a lot of pages will have, like if you go to your Gmail or Yahoo Mail account, there'll be a sign out button. And a lot of organizations, a lot of sites will tell you, when you're done, please sign out. Why? Well, because they don't want their computer, their web server, worrying about all these sessions for people that have finished looking at their email 20 minutes ago. Right? Each session takes up a certain amount of overhead on the server. And as, depending on what you store, it takes up either a little bit or a lot. If you store simple variables like strings and integers and all that, it doesn't take up much. But you can actually store more, more complex objects, and that's where you get into trouble with saving too much stuff. All right? When you pick a timeout period, you want to hit the sweet spot. You don't want it too long or you don't want it too short. All right? If your session timeout is too short, then you're penalizing someone that takes a minute to think of how to answer an email. Right? If I set the session timeout on the server for 